Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Luke Bible Study with Pastor Robert. We hope that you dive deeply into Scripture as you draw nearer to God. Thanks for joining us, and have a great study. Gracious Father, we do thank you and praise you for your divine presence with us even this night. It is our heart's desire to draw near unto you, O precious Jesus, and as your word says, that you would draw near unto us. That's our heart's desire. Um, Lord, we are, are your children. You have called us by your name. Your spirit has been granted to us to turn our hearts from stone to be hearts of flesh. And you have spoken your precious word to us. Uh, and our ears have been opened to hear. Our eyes have been opened to see. And our hearts have been opened to receive you, Jesus So we ask for your blessing as we launch into our study time of Luke chapter 5 tonight and pray from the busy day that all of us have had that we might turn the corner even right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us and aid us uh, that we might focus upon Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh. There we go. So thanks, everybody. Everybody got an outline. We're in Luke chapter 5. Uh, please make sure your Bible's turned open to that. Luke chapter 5, an outline from your table. And we've got a marvelous scripture in front of us. Very familiar text, I think. But uh, I'm praying that we can just dig even further in our understanding of the familiar text and ask God to bless us in that. Tonight, um, yeah, just as a little bit of a, a, a change, we're going to read the whole chapter in in one section so it will need a little bit of recall on all of our parts when we get to the individual parts i'll break the chapter up into into three major uh, parts the roman numerals on your outline but the third one has three sub points so there are five sections that we look at in chapter five tonight and and uh, I gave the title of who is this man as the question in quotation marks because this is actually the Uh, exclamation or the question that the Pharisees make of Jesus in tonight's text in in verse 21. If you look ahead to verse 21, who is this man? Who is this fellow? Some of your translations, they might have said it a little bit snide or sarcastic. Who is this man? And we're going to ask the same thing and ask God to open our eyes to more of Christ tonight. So anybody care to be our reader? It's the whole chapter in one reading tonight the whole chapter it's not the genealogies at least right Right? (laughs) so um yeah you know the lake of gennesaret it might be the only one and you can say that in a couple different ways too is in the first verse that might be the only unusual term but anybody can I, i see a volunteer there so please let's give our attention to the reading of the word and follow along in your translation please chapter five Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets in for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But at your bidding, I will let the nets down. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching them. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And it came about that while he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, 
If you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and great multitudes were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But he himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And when it came about one day that he was teaching, there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him for healing. And behold, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tile with his stretcher, right in the center in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, Rise and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise and take up your stretcher and go home. And at once he rose up before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. And after that, he went out and noticed the tax gatherer named Levi sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and rose and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax gatherers and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come. And when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined but new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. Well, isn't that a marvelous text? Thanks for that careful and excellent reading of the word. I mean, we got enough to work on for a week, don't we? Huh? Yeah, no wonder we don't preach whole chapters at a time, right, Pastor Adam? Because six verses. we just can't get through. Yeah, six verses is good enough because there's so much always in God's word for tonight. So who is this man? Who is this man? You know, God, uh, may we draw near to Christ tonight, right? So on your outlines there, Roman number one, the calling of Simon is the first 11 verses that we're looking at tonight. And and just to draw you in from last week, because again, there's some parts as I'm trying to uh, balance our study to cover the whole chapter. You know, we don't, we get lots of time up front and then we miss some text, you know, way at the end of our hour. Um, last week in Nazareth, uh, you know, Jesus came and read from the scroll of Isaiah. And, uh, you know, he said, I, I fulfilled this scripture today. And they're so furious that they want to kill him. They want to run him off the edge of the cliff and 
and uh, stone him their death. And you know what? Uh, tonight, <laughs> you run across a guy like Simon uh, Peter, and all of a sudden, not everybody is wanting to kill Christ. Not everybody is wanting to throw him off a cliff. All of a sudden, here we are introduced to someone here that you know we're familiar with from lots of teaching and preaching, but uh, God is doing some kind of work in this person tonight, and uh, he's going to leave his business, his livelihood, his security, his insurance, all of it, all of it, and, and just go with Jesus, right? Come and follow me, right? And I'll make you a fisher of men. What, what an incredible, incredible commitment um, that we see him making here. Now, th- this picture of, of Christ teaching in the boat and uh, the great catch of fish, it actually is repeated a second time in Scripture, almost the exact same picture. Does anybody know when? Post-resurrection, in your notes at the top, you see John 21. After the resurrection, this almost exact same story, as if it's a second recommissioning of Peter, happens. You know, and Jesus is on the shore, and he says, you know, throw your nets off on the other side. We've been fishing all night. We've got nothing. And all of a sudden, you know, the nets are so full, and they know it's Jesus. So you'll have to read John 21, a post-resurrection fishing trip, um, because almost the exact same thing happens, of course, in conjunction with Peter. So we look at this, the call, we call this the call of Simon. Jesus is calling him to salvation, I believe. He's calling him also to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And this call that we have in the first 11 verses matches uh, many of the Old Testament calls. When you read uh, either the prophet Isaiah is one of my favorites in your notes, chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Uh, Jeremiah, we just, you know, studied the call of him to uh, serve as God's prophet. Um, so we see many things that are the same in, in this text tonight. In, in verse three, of course, we see the divine initiative. You see God approaches Peter. It's not Peter who's approaching Jesus. Jesus comes to Peter and says, you know, I want you to be mine right? In, in a saving relationship and then in a work relationship. In verse 8, uh, Peter knows after this great catch of fish, there is something dramatically different between himself and Jesus. He just comes out with this statement, I'm a sinful man. Where did that come from? You see, the holiness of Jesus that makes this unexplicable event happen when they labored um, verse five, they've worked hard all night. They've sweat all night. The, the Greek verb they've labored with their nets. They've checked all their depth gauges and sounding equipment and nothing. Right. And how does this guy who's not a fisherman know that there's, you know, fish out there for us to catch. And, and, and there's just this holy moment, Right where this guy knows this is, this is so abnormal. This is of God, right? This is of God. Verse eight, the experience of the catch similar in Isaiah chapter six, remember uh, the uh, one of the angels comes and, and with a tongs grabs a live burning charcoal from the altar and places it on his lips. See the experience of the catch, the experience of this coal. These are all parts of this pattern of a divine call when God is calling somebody. We see many of these things. Then verse 10 in our text, there's divine reassurance to Peter. Don't be afraid, right? Because he who is the Holy One in the boat in front of you isn't going to throw you over and, and sink you because you're a sinful man, right? Why didn't Jesus just create a millstone and hang it around Peter's neck at that point and drown him? That sinful, wretched man See, there's divine reassurance. God is doing a saving work. He's doing a gracious work. I mean, the miracle in and of itself, right? And in, um, in uh, the Isaiah text, the angel says, your sins have been atoned for. Instead of that burning coal uh, cauterizing or searing uh, his lips, which, you know, I mean, folks, don't do this at home, right? Take a charcoal and put it on your lips. It cleanses him. It's a saving act. It's a marvelous act, right? Uh, Not what you expect. It's this experience that God gives 
in many occasions here in Holy Scripture. And then the commission in verse 10, the commission, I want you now to go and catch men. I want you to go and catch people, right? I mean, a metaphor, a word picture, he knew fishing best. Now it's not the slimy things with scales. It's people who matter to God, the lost who matter to God. And unless you, Peter, go out and tell people of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of men, they'll never know. They'll never know. So I want to enlist you, you know, in to do that. And, and uh, in Isaiah, you re- might remember the text, right, uh, where God in Trinity says, who will go for us, right? Whom can we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, send me. yeah, see this, this commissioning, send me. Right? There's just the compulsion of God working in an individual. Many of your testimonies have that same kind of thing where God just moved and acted on you. Right, So a couple of just historical notes about your text. Verse 1, Lake of Gennesaret. It's not the familiar term for the lake. The familiar term is Galilee. Galilee. Right. This term Gennesaret is used only three times in the Gospels. It is speaking of the region which is just south of Capernaum, like the county or, uh, you know, something like that. The township, Gennesaret, is the region. It was called that. It's on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is about eight miles by 13 or 14 miles. It's not huge, but it's bigger than Silver and Irigami, isn't it? Right? It was a good fishing lake, um, eight miles by 14 miles. In the Old Testament, it was called Kinnereth or Chinnereth um, in your notes from Numbers and Joshua and so forth. And Simon in verse 3, um, this is his, his given name. We saw him for the first time last week in chapter 4 because his mother-in-law had a fever. We didn't get a lot of time to talk about that text, but there we find out having a mother-in-law must also mean that he has a wife. Who's her name? What's her name? Where's she in Holy Scripture? Never appears once. Mrs. Peter never appears once. Did they have kids? We don't know. Probably, right? In the fishing business, you'd kind of like a lot of help, right? Mrs. Peter would scale and the children would, you know, put them on the, the fire to salt them or whatever, you know, they might all do. But that's the best we can do because Holy Scripture didn't give any information at all about her. Right. And then he has a name that Jesus gives to him, you know, Petros or Peter, meaning rock that comes from the gospel of John. And in our text tonight, you see the two names that are put together in verse eight. Right. Simon is maybe given name and Peter's the name that was given to him by Jesus in the gospel of John when his brother Andrew brought, you know, Peter to him. So and then we meet in uh, verse 10, James and John, we meet. Uh, partners of Simon. So they're in the fishing business here. Their father is Zebedee. And uh, these three men become what relationship to Jesus? Peter, James, and John. Um, Yes, more specifically? More specifically yet? Yep, they are. There we go. The the inner circle of the 12. These first three mentioned as Luke arranges his particular gospel. This is the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They they play significant ministry roles. So in every ministry team, in every ministry team, you know, Jesus chose 12, but there's three that he worked with in particular. Even we follow that model, you know, even uh, today in churches and such, right? I mean, we have large ministry teams, but in those teams, things are subdivided and, and people work with people under them. Why did he change... Just Peter's name and not the other two? Because um, they had great names. <laughs> it's a great question. D- d- yes, great question. Does, I mean, you know, p- even Peter among the 12, of course, had a huge role in the life of, you know, Jesus' three year ministry over the other 11. Of course, Judas might say he had a huge role as well, too. Um, so, does the name change, you know, indicate? You know, of course, part of his conversion, part of his significant role, you know, with Jesus, that's the best I could come up with. And Levi and Matthew, but that's not a name change. Uh, Levi and Matthew, Levi might have been like his, 
born or baptized name and Matthew, you know, might have been his um, pr- professional name because he's a dirty, rotten, tax collecting Jew. Scoundrel. Yeah. That wasn't a name change, but thanks for bringing that up. Um, but that's all I could come up with, you know, on the, yeah, I mean, the different, you know, the, con- and of course, you know, Peter plays a significant role in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, the preaching of the gospel. He's the one who said, you guys killed Jesus. So does the name change, you know, indicate the change of person? Obviously, the name represents the person, right? So maybe that's the best, you know, to come up with. The Catholic Church. Oh, yeah. Just change their name. And it's like, oh, yeah. Not that I totally understand. If I change mine, can I be the Pope? <laughs> yes. I can? Yeah. Oh, hey, we'll it's take funny hat well, to go to Green Bay. Let's, let's take that vote now. Let's not wait. <laughs> yeah. So those are good thoughts. I appreciate that. Uh, In James and John, you know, they were called also by uh, a nickname that I think Jesus gave them, Boanerges. Anybody remember the translation, James and John? I know. I I always thought I was that way going through school and college and well, sons of thunder, man. I just wanted to smoke people, you know, sons of, you know, they wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans who weren't welcoming Jesus and Jesus gave them that name. So they kind of had a a rough edge to them, you know, on there. But anyway, and of course, John, John, of course, is the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he had a really key role, you know, I mean, at, at the last supper, right. All the pictures of John's John's head on Jesus breast, you know, in the, in the paintings and the pictures. Plus he wrote a lot of scripture, right? John, the gospel, the three epistles and revelation. He wrote a lot of Holy scripture. You know, Peter, of course, the two epistles he, he wrote. And uh, his sidekick, Peter's sidekick? Uh, in this text, Mark. Peter, Peter's sidekick in shadow is Mark. And, of course, we have the gospel because of that. So, you know, Mark was on the missionary journeys, and he wasn't always helpful for Paul. But, uh, you know, so we got some name connections there. I hope that that's interesting, right? So question one is, is Simon converted is he called to ministry or are both happening in this particular text? Is he converted in this text? Is he called to ministry or both? Any comments there or questions? I think it's being groomed. Gr- groomed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And are we not yet too? Are you and I not yet being <laughs> by the Holy Spirit? Thanks, please. The Holy Spirit gives this light to us where we see things spiritually that we couldn't see without the spirit of God. Mm-hmm. And Peter saw something, something over oh, yeah. his Oh Yeah, right. And to me, it seems like he got converted. Yeah, I kind of look he at... He confesses his sin. I'm a yeah. sinful man. Yeah. yeah, I do kind of look at it that way. And so as we add some material together, it's interesting if we went to John chapter 1, uh, I think I left that in your notes... Um, it's Simon's brother who doesn't get much press at all in Holy scripture, Simon's brother, Andrew, Andrew's the one who brought Peter to Jesus, Andrew. So that's not, Luke doesn't record that part. That's in the, in the gospel of Mark, where it's Simon's brother, Andrew, who spends a whole day with Jesus. Andrew is checking out who is this? Are you really the Christ in John one? And he goes, and I'm sure Andrew is convinced and he tells Simon that he found the Messiah. Now, don't forget uh, last week in in Luke chapter four, Simon's mother-in-law was healed. Even that event had to have been, you know, the Holy Spirit's preparatory work of of bringing, you know, Simon, you know, to a saving relationship or saving understanding or knowledge of who Jesus is. I like the expression in verse five that Simon makes in verse five. Just glance it there. We've, we've worked hard all night long and haven't caught anything, but, but, but at your word, folks, that's, that's a little, little glimmer of, of a faith statement, whether it's a saving faith statement or not, but at your word, in other words, I'm not going to be the arrogant fisherman tonight who knows what I'm doing because you're a rabbi. Well, you're not even a trained rabbi and you don't know anything about fishing. That's what we would have expected from peter right but at your word or you know i just i love this and i i keep praying jesus give me this kind of a spirit because you say so 
a humble, obedient spirit, because you say so. It makes no rational sense to me whatsoever, God. Are we not in that position many a times? And it's like, we're going to put God on the shelf because we think we know better. But because you say so, because you say so, I'm going to walk humbly and I'm going to walk obediently. I think that statement is of real importance. Verse 8, the recognition of sin and that they should be separate. Now, I'm, I'm, this is a true Peter statement, you know, in verse 8, you know, go away from me. Where do you suppose Jesus was supposed to go? Folks, the boat is sinking. Water's coming in over the bow. Where did, where did Peter want him to go? I mean, he wanted a walk on water moment. He doesn't even know Jesus can do that yet, right? I, I just think that, you know, sometimes this humble confession of folks is like, what, what is he going to fly out of the boat? <laughs> is a, you know, drone going to pick him up, a helicopter or something like that? So this is interesting, you know, there. And then we get to verse 10, which is literally a calling of Simon Peter to go and fish. And in verse 11, the, the dramatic, you know, effect of leaving everything, leave everything, everything, all of it. Someone else took the catch that day. You better believe it. And he left and he followed, which, which is that biblical statement of, you know, there's a connection here, right? He followed. And Jesus has called us, you know, in, in the same way too, right? The declaration. Well, you get to Luke chapter 9, verse 20, you know, and Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? What's Peter's answer? Luke chapter 9, this is jump. Yeah, you're the Christ. See, his faith is growing it's solidifying it's concreting you know by the time we get there and then in acts chapter two he's preaching the gospel to people like i wish i could preach today you know you you killed christ you're the ones who nailed him to the tree right so repent and be baptized otherwise you know uh the axe is at the root of the tree like john the baptist said and i think it's powerful if you turn to first peter chapter one verse two please let's do that together whoops i gotta watch my timing First Peter chapter one, this is Peter's writing. And I think as we read the introduction of his writing, his first epistle, I think there's some clue words that stand out for me that say, oh yeah, the Lord is doing a powerful work in Peter in this text in Luke chapter five. He's doing a powerful work, right? Have you found first Peter one, everybody? And you might want to circle or highlight a few things in here. Let's, uh, let's look at this verse together. Just part of it, then, uh, for our timing here, Peter says, you know, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. In this text, Jesus simply chooses Peter, right? He just chooses him. Come follow me, right? And uh, there wasn't any particular, you know, debate on, well, don't I get a choice at this point? You see, I mean, (laughs) there wasn't an argument or a discussion or what are the terms of me following you? Can Can we have this in print? You know, it was just simply that he was chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. God had a foreknowledge of who Simon was. And this happened through, of course, the sanctifying work of the spirit for obedience to Jesus uh, and the sprinkling of his blood. All those words are so stacked and loaded. I think they they helped me understand, you know, Luke chapter five. He left everything and followed Jesus. Isn't that a powerful statement from Peter at that point? There was a comment or two. I think I saw a hand over here. Did I miss one? This is all set up from his mother-in-law and and using Peter's boat even. Yeah, using Peter's boat. (laughs) Right, he uses Peter's boat. You know, Jesus is on an objective. Guess what? He accomplishes his objective. (laughs) Aren't you glad he accomplished his objective with you? So that's our question number two. What, if anything, is different from the calling of Simon to serve and follow Christ and yours, your calling to serve and follow Christ? What's different, if anything? Christ wasn't present. Okay. So Christ was not physically, bodily present when the Holy Spirit called you to respond to Jesus Christ. Great. That's an important observation. What else? What else is different, if anything, about Peter's calling and yours? Okay. 
Well, when we were called, it was after the uh, resurrection, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And we have the benefit of the New Testament mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to explain. That. Yep. Yep. So timing. Yep. We're a little bit. The Holy Spirit yeah. was not given yet. Okay. Not given, but present and working. still working because no heart is ever open except by the Holy Spirit. No eye is ever seen except by the Holy Spirit, you know? So, yeah. And Peter is the transition because that, you know, within three years of this time, he has the fullness of the residency of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What else? What else? Please. Well, I think it's, it's different for everybody because some people will respond quickly like Peter did. Okay. Some people will be like slow potatoes, <laughs> wander around, checking everything out. Yeah. And, well, I'm not quite sure. Let me look into this. I'm looking into, yeah. look into this. So, yes, it can be the same. And yes, it can be very different. Mm -hmm. Right. We will come to text pretty quickly in Luke of, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, calling people if anyone wants to follow him. Just about the same things he said to any of the first century folks, you know, this is this is the requirement. Deny yourself. Take up the cross. Follow me. The exact same words. Exact same words applied to all people today. If you're sitting in this Bible study or on Zoom or somebody hears this later or on church on Sunday, it's the same call. Follow me, right? Jesus is still making fishers of men. That's this church's mission ultimately, right? And we're, we're looking to rebuild our bell curve. The bell curve of a church is rebuilt when we take this calling so literally that we start looking for people that Jesus wants to call, bring to himself, right? That's all of us doing that, right? All of us inviting people, hey, I know who Jesus is. Come and see. Come and see. Some people have their heels dug in. Yeah. And God keeps pursuing them. He does. Yeah, he does. Aren't you glad for that? Well, question three, I'll leave for you to process. We need to move on to part two. Let's look at the second major part of our text tonight, the healing of a leper. The healing of a leper. Um, this is an amazing text that brings more, uh, you know, to, to our, our study than, you know, our casual reading might be. Um, Luke, who, you know, is a doctor, is the one who very carefully in verse 12 says something about the leprosy of the man, verse 12. What does he note about the leprosy that the other gospel writers don't? I'll just let you know. Covered or full, which means he's near death. That's what it means. He's near death. Now, Luke, uh, Leviticus, in your notes, chapters 13 and 14, are the chapters that talk about uh, skin diseases and leprosy and cleansing and, and how um, in the Old Testament the Israelites were to be taken care of. And, and this term leprosy could also be, you know, what happens in your basement if you don't have a dehumidifier, you get what on the walls? That's the, the same term is used for that or on garments and clothing that got mold, you know. So all the folks in Florida, you know, the power is out. All your clothing was wet because the roof was off. You've got mold everywhere. That's the, that's the term used. So it's a skin disease, but it's also mold on walls or clothing. And in Leviticus chapter 13, if you had leprosy, you were to wear torn clothing. Your hair was to remain unkempt. Your face uniquely was to be covered, just like COVID covered. It says this in the Old Testament. And you were to cry out what when somebody got near you? Twice. Unclean, unclean. You were a social outcast. You could not participate in the worship life of the community of Israel whatsoever. This was a living death, a living death. In verse 14, Jesus has already healed this man by the touch in verse 13, which is just outstanding because nobody in their right mind would touch a leper because it's contagion. Nobody. The, so he tells the man that he should go see the priest and get you know, to, to have this healing and this cleansing uh, verified. 
Um, the priests were the medical examiners. It seems a little strange to us. They, they were the medical examiners. They're the ones who quarantined you and, and told you you had to stay outside the community. You couldn't come into the, the tabernacle or into the temple. They're the ones who would do that. Now, this same thing, go and see the priest and be checked out and verified, was all detailed in Leviticus 13 and 14. When we get to the 10 lepers that Jesus cleanses in Luke 17, he says the same thing. Go and be checked out by the priest so that you can come back into the worship community and so forth. And in verse 14, you'll also notice a very key phrase that Luke alone includes that he should go to the priests as a testimony to them. To the priests, a testimony of what? A testimony that the Messiah has come and done this. And this is where the, the reading of it gets really more interesting. Now, leprosy, let's just remind ourselves a little bit about it. This is my favorite Messianic Jewish author, Fruchtenbaum. Leprosy mentioned in the Gospels would refer to Hansen's disease, which is caused by a bacterial infection. In the vast majority of cases, the initial symptom is numbness in the fingers and toes. And if left untreated, the disease slowly progresses to the next stages. Yellowish lesions develop deep in the skin on the genitalia, face, forehead, and joints. The hair growing in the affected area assumes the same color as the legion. And as the disease progresses so slowly, it can take up to 10 years for the microorganisms to eventually penetrate through the cellular tissue and reach the muscles and bones. Hair begins to turn white, woolly, and eventually falls out. There is a gelatinous swelling that forms in the cellular tissue. As time progresses, the skin becomes hard, rough, and seamy. Large scabs form, which fall off from time to time, exposing running sores. The nails swell, curl up, and fall off. There is a loss of mucous membrane, resulting in constantly bleeding gums. The nose is stuffed, and there is a constant flow of saliva. Because the bacteria attack the nerves, the senses become dull. In the last stages of leprosy, the victim experiences extreme weight loss and becomes very weak, suffering from chronic diarrhea, chronic thirst, and a burning fever. Finally, there is an attack on the internal and vital organs leading to death. The leper in this account has entered into the final stages of the disease, and we know this because Luke again observes something the other gospel writers don't. The man was full of it. The leprosy was killing him. And he knew his days were numbered. Now, Jesus touches him and heals him. And he's supposed to go to the priest and have this healing be certified as being accomplished. In Leviticus 14, if we took the time, the priest would meet this man outside of the community, right? Wherever he's local and wherever the priest you know, would be that he'd meet. In chapter 14, in Leviticus 14, verse 4, he would offer two birds as an offering. One of them was killed and its blood was drained. The other bird live was dipped into the blood of the bird that was killed. In verse 7, Leviticus 14, this blood was sprinkled seven times on the man and he was pronounced clean and the bird was released. In verse 8, Leviticus 14, on the eighth day, he was to bring in four sacrifices to the, the temple or tabernacle, a sin, a trespass, a burnt, and a meal offering. And in verse 14, the blood of the sacrifice was applied to the right ear lobe of the healed man, to the right uh, hand thumb, and to the right foot big toe. Yeah, this is pretty specific, folks. In verse 17, oil was applied to the exact same three places. Here's the point. When in Holy Scripture do you ever remember that this testimony of someone being healed occurred? There were 10 lepers that were healed. Is that what you mean? No, this, what I just accounted, the certification of the healing. When in Holy Scripture have you ever read that anyone was certified to be healed by a priest? The answer is never. Never. 
No person in scripture was ever certified by a priest as healed. That's why this simple text, which reads so quickly, is significant because this is called a messianic miracle. It never happened. It never happened. There was no Jew in the Old Testament who was ever healed of leprosy. That's why this catches the attention of all the religious leaders. Verse 17, verse 17, look at your text. Verse 17, one day as he was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from the regions of Judea and Jerusalem, this has raised such a fury that this, you know, the the religious leaders are going to check if this messianic movement has merit to it. That's why this text is extremely important. Scripture never certified that any leper had ever been healed or cleansed. There is no scripture to do that. There's none. That's why this uniquely points to Christ as the Messiah. It's called a messianic miracle because nobody... But the Messiah can restore this. There is no healing that can be given to a leper. There's two other miracles that certify who the Messiah would be. The rabbis knew this. Casting out a demon that created muteness. Because how do you restore the voice to somebody? It medically cannot be done. Not in biblical times, you understand. And the third messianic miracle was uh, the opening of the eyes of a man who's born blind. You cannot do that. These three things were unable to be performed, even though the scripture gave the details of how restoration should occur. The scripture never testifies that it was ever done. Never until Christ. So it raises religious fury because people are wondering, is this the Messiah? Now you'd all hope it's like, oh, glory, hallelujah. If Jesus could drop Peter a fisherman, couldn't he draw these religious leaders to himself that their eyes would see, that their ears would hear, that their hearts would be open? And we find out, of course, in the text tonight that it just isn't going to be the case. I asked for you question number five, uh, I'm sorry, four in this section. How, How does my humility and God's will factor into personal healing? The leper said, you know, to Jesus, Lord, if you're willing, if you're willing, verse 12, if you're willing, you can make me clean. How does humility and God's will, if you're willing, you can make me clean? How does that factor into personal healing? How do you deal with that? Because, you know, some of you might say, I've not been healed. I've prayed and I've not been healed. How, How do we work through Holy Scriptures on this matter? Anybody? Here's a comment. Um, there is a group of Christians that believe you have to have faith to be healed. And if you're not healed, you don't have enough faith. Okay. And it's a matter of, it, for me, healing it is all up to God. There's nothing I can do to earn it or get it, but I know he is able. Okay, great. That's that's and, helpful. Unfortunately, there are some churches too that and there's one in Ashcott right now that if you're sick, then you're supposed to have some kind of sin. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, that, and it's too bad we get divided like that. Okay. Um, actually, that's, that is a carryover even from, from our text tonight that we'll talk about even yet. Um, what, was, it, was it sin that caused this guy to get leprosy? The, the Pharisees had that question, was it sin that caused this man to be paralytic? And this is a divine judgment, you know, that these things, the, the Pharisees saw these things as divine judgments. So it's not unusual that even churches yet today would see, well, see, you, you must have done something horribly wrong um, that you have leprosy or you're paralytic and God hasn't delivered you. Right. Yeah. And it becomes really, really hard if, if, if you say I, you don't have enough faith. It's like, well, I think the, the day I'll have, you know, the fullest faith is the day I see Jesus. So I guess I'm in tough luck. <laughs> right? 
the day I'll have the fullest faith that there is to have is the day I see him. So work hard at it. You know, I mean, that's a really tough message to give to people to say you don't have enough faith because I think the emphasis becomes more than on you versus on the ability of Jesus, right? Comment or question, Jesus, healing in God's will. If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, it's, it's either faith or no faith. It's not how yeah, much faith. Not, yeah, the degree becomes messy when we start saying it's a degree thing. Thanks, that's helpful. Okay, so um, Jesus with a touch, and he's identified then as messianic. Let's move on, please, to part three, because we've got, we've got three very huge texts to work through tonight. And they all tie together. They really do. The leper is a social outcast. Well, what do you think the paralytic is? He, see, there, there's this common theme. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm not going to say, because guess what? Our best fishermen are not at study tonight. They're out, they're out duck hunting. <laughs> you know, and I don't think they're listening to this anyway, you know, but to say fishermen weren't outcasts. I mean, it was an important industry, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't go that so far. But the rest of the theme of tonight, I mean, this leper, unless he got cleansed, you know, he, he, he would not enter into the community, the fellowship, the worship. He was totally cut off. Well, how much more so than a guy who's paralytic? I mean, he didn't have a disease, but if somebody doesn't pick me up and move me in, you know, with other folks. So th- this was also part of... Um, you know, being an outcast in a Jewish society. So part three, the advent of religious controversy. Our last texts have this common theme uh, of, of being outcast that Jesus specifically, you know, reaches out to. So we have the forgiven uh, paralytic in verses 17 to 26, the forgiven paralytic. This is actually the first of five uh, controversies that Luke reports simultaneously, three of them then close our chapter tonight. The next two are next week. So come back (laughs) next week. There are five texts in a row that Luke puts together that shows all the ministry that Jesus does raises controversy with the establishment, with the religious leaders, the Jude, uh, the, the Pharisees, uh, of, of the day. It creates controversies, and we find that out specifically as we move forward. So um, now in verse 17, as you look in that, we've mentioned that there's a mob. All the religious leaders have heard word of the messianic miracle of a leopard being cleansed. So they swarm, and as they do that, they're going, likely we're in the Capernaum, uh, Capernaum area, I put in my notes, that's approximately 60 miles or three days walk. They're coming from all of Israel. This is what the religious leaders had to do to verify messianic movements. They had to find out, is there truth to it or not? Do we dismiss it or do we not? You know, uh, because they're, they know enough of the scripture to say we're looking for the Messiah, Right. So that's, they're coming from everything. Now we read about the Pharisees. This is the first time they're mentioned in the book. The Pharisees, they are non-priests. They're not Levitical priests. They're separatists. Um, and, And they work together to uphold the Mosaic law in the, in the, uh, uh, Pentateuch, the Mosaic law. There are 613 laws that Moses gave Israel. These guys are the protectors of those laws to make sure that Israel would not violate the Mosaic laws. So the Pharisees wrote laws on how to keep the laws of Moses. They did not want you to violate the Sabbath day. So when you go to Israel today on the Sabbath, what does the elevator do? It goes at every floor without you touching a button because that was violating the Sabbath. So you go there and the elevator goes up and down on its own at every floor because to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy meant you don't work by touching the button of the elevator. The Pharisees created the law so that you would not violate the Mosaic law and Uh, they're the ones who are the protectors of it, right? Because they believe that the Babylonian captivity of Israel 70 years, of course, was because of Israel's failure to keep the law, which they were correct in. They failed to keep God's law. 
and they want to prevent another captivity of Israel. So they wrote, you know, books and got hundreds and thousands of other laws on how to keep the law. Um, today, those are called the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. And then they're put together in a book called the Talmud. Are any of those terms familiar? Mm -hmm. The Talmud might be the one that you're more familiar with. Okay. So these guys are introduced then, then by Luke. And then a second group, verse 17, the teachers of the law. This is the first time they're mentioned. They're a subset of the Pharisees. They're religious lawyers. So they codified, you know, the words in the documents of the Pharisees and put them in print. Um, and, and we know of a, 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 a teacher of the law in the book of Acts named Gamaliel. And from the Old Testament, uh, uh, Ezra was a teacher of the law. He was a scribe. The second name for them is given in verse 21. The teachers of the law are called by a second name in verse 21, scribes. They wrote out the laws and, you know, made sure that they were available. Now, how do you love four friends who somehow have heard of Christ and will do anything to get their paralyzed friend to him? May God give us a renewed spirit that our hearts ache for the lost in our families and our relationships, that we will do anything at WCC to bring people who are paralyzed by sin to Jesus. May God work that in us, brothers and sisters. That's how new curves get made. We so care. We'll do anything. In fact, we'll rip open a roof. Houses in the first century were one room made out of, uh, of stone or um, clay walls. The roof would have had some kind of beams from trees and then uh, flax or other kind of reeds as a material, you know, laid on that and then clay put on top of that. If you had a really fancy or expensive house, as Luke indicates, the clay wasn't just slapped on as three or four inches of clay to, you know, keep water and moisture out of your house. It was made into tiles. Do, do you see the note? Luke specifically says tiles. None of the other gospels mention that. So these guys go up the steps, which were typically on the outside of a, a house, just a square house, flat roofs. That's all they have. There's no shingles. There's no peaked roofs in, in a first century house. And they take this guy up there. They rip open the guy's house. I want to know what the homeowner's thinking. Does my insurance cover this? The homeowner is there. He's never mentioned in the text, is he? Right? And Jesus is teaching and the religious leaders are crowding in and other people are crowding in. And, and here all of a sudden stuff starts coming down on him. And, and you know, and the people are looking up and Jesus is teaching. And, and with ropes, they lower their friend on a stretcher. You know, that's the type of term Luke mentioned, like a mat, a, a stretcher type of thing. You know, four ropes and they, you know, they, that's a pretty big hole. I mean... I don't think the guy was over six foot, but a lot of work. it's a lot of work. And for them to hold it now, maybe, you know, and then people, I suppose people are kind of scattering, you know, to make room for this descending, you know, uh, a mattress coming out of the sky. So um, Jesus, verse 20, what does he see about these four men? Jesus, verse 20. Oh, oh, folks, here's, here's your best definition of faith because it's in action faith without works james says is dead folks you can have all the information you want about jesus that's not saving here's faith in action in fact risking the animosity of the homeowner and did they patch it up when the whole story is over we don't know that either you see did they get more mud and clay tiles and you know stuff so Christ saw their faith. Now we get to the heart of verse 20, which we can't miss. Jesus says to the man, why didn't he say, listen carefully, there's a difference. I forgive you versus your sins are forgiven. What's the difference? I forgive you. Your sins 
are forgiven. Passive and active. The verbs are passive and active. Okay, now here's the hook, brothers and sisters. Turn really quick to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. Okay? Yeah, and who's doing it? You know, who's doing it? Now, it's obvious Jesus is saying the statement, but he uses a passive statement, a passive statement. He's not particularly drawing attention to himself, except for he's the one who's saying it, which becomes obvious. In Levit, did I say Luke? Leviticus chapter 4. This is more Leviticus than most believing Christians do in months, maybe a lifetime, right? Leviticus 4 verse 20. Get to the end of the verse and you'll find a statement that has a passive, the same statement Jesus says, way at the end of the verse. Your sins are forgiven. forgiven. It's passive. And if your translation doesn't have it, it's incorrect. Your, your, your sins will be forgiven. You will be forgiven. It's a passive statement. If your translation doesn't have it, it's an incorrect translation. In fact, let your eye glance to verse 26. At the end of verse 26, you'll see the same thing. Are forgiven. Verse 31. Are forgiven. Verse 35. They will be, maybe you have, they will be forgiven. And then it's in chapter 5, verse 10, 13, 16, 18, and chapter 6, verse 7. Your sins are forgiven. Here's the point, brothers and sisters. The Pharisees know that only God can forgive sins, right? That's what they say. Who are you? Who is this man? Only God alone can forgive sins. They know this Leviticus text has this passive thing in it that you will be forgiven jesus uses the exact same statement thus jesus is claiming to be god who are you see the controversy is ramping up between the religious leaders and the identity of jesus who are you okay Now, it gets even better because as we go further in this text, Jesus will use a brand new term that has never been used before in the particular gospel um, because he's going to, uh, I'm sorry, am I going to say that in the the part about the um, eating with the sinners? He's going to talk about verse 24 being the son of man. Here's the first time that term is used. Now, all of a sudden, if Jesus is God because he uses the same forgiving statement as God uses in the Pentateuch, right? Are you getting that? If Jesus is God, he's also man because he addresses himself as the son of man. He's the God man. This is Messiah with us. This is, this is then such a clear revelation in this event of this healing of the deity and the humanity of Jesus. And the religious leaders will say, who do you think you are? Claiming that you're God and that you can forgive sin? And then he goes, well, I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth. I can do this as the God-man on earth. And I'll prove to you how I can forgive sin. How does he prove? (laughs) He uses a rabbinic uh, uh, method, a rabbinic method of a, of a comparison from a lesser to a greater. This is, this is a rabbinic teaching school thing, right? I mean, if I can say to some, if it's easy enough, see, it's a comparison. What's easier to say your sins are forgiven or to get up, take your mat and go home, which is easier. Your sins are forgiven. That's easy to say. It's a rabbinic thing, a comparison between a lesser and a greater. The greater thing, I mean, because you can't, you can't verify that what you've just said is true. You can't verify your sins are forgiven. There's no verification. That's easy. This is a rabbinic thing to get wisdom and information and knowledge to these religious leaders. So to prove to you that I can do the easier, forgive your sin, I'm going to do the harder and say the greater, get up and walk. Instantly, the guy gets up and walks. And right before you, 
is the God-man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? Who in Isaiah would be born of a virgin, right? In flesh, he, and he will rule the nations, right? And, and all the other, uh, you know, messianic uh, uh, texts that, that we can think of. And, and it's right before when they say, you know, this fellow is speaking blasphemy. By the way, blasphemy is the final charge that ultimately gets Jesus crucified. crucified. Mm -hmm. Blasphemy. Mm -hmm. You claim to be God. And so this controversy, do you see how this is brewing? Will be throughout the whole Gospels. And finally, they bring witnesses forward, you know, because, you know, one wouldn't agree with another. But finally, we heard this fellow say, right? Yeah, that he claimed to be God. And Pilate goes through that, you know, whole thing and. And ultimately, the Jews will say, this is why we have a right to kill him. He, he's blasphemed the name uh, because he's claimed to be God. Well, what an amazing, you know, text, right? This is the heart of Jesus' ministry to forgive sin. It's the heart of it. And that's why you and I are here tonight as well, too. Um, and this guy gets up and Jesus takes care of his uh, spiritual need and he takes care of his physical need. All at the same time, right? Wow. Well, um, let's go to the banquet then. Uh, let's go to the next text because controversy keeps brewing. We're in uh, letter B then, the sinner's banquet. This is the second of five controversies in a row that Luke reports. And here the Pharisees uh, are going to see Jesus eating with sinners. Eating with sinners and tax collectors, okay? So we're at verse 27, letter B. Um, Levi is the tax collector. His other name then is the, in the Gospels, uh, maybe a professional name. Yeah, Matthew. He's been he's been called. Very, it's a very simple text. He's been called, you know, to follow Jesus. And interesting enough, there's no particular debate here in this text either. Like, well, you know what? I do have some other things on my mind I'd like to accomplish before the age of fifty. It's it's powerful, isn't it? When Christ calls. People answer. It's powerful. There, there, there isn't any entertainment of a debate uh, in, in this particular uh, situation. And the same calling, come, you know, follow me. So um, in the King James, the tax collector is called a publican. Now, the publican, if you have that in your translation, is actually a, a wealthy Roman Gentile person who worked for the Roman government, a publican. That, that's a Latin term for, for the immediate people who were the, the tax assessors uh, in, in the Roman world. And these publicans, well, they didn't want to do the work either. So they hired out Jewish people to be the local tax collectors or guides. And they're the ones who would uh, take care of income tax. There was income tax. And they would take care of levying um, the, the movement of goods and services and people from village to village or, you know, community to community. So there was um, uh, tax uh, for traveling, traveling tax, like going to Illinois and having to pay tolls. And it doesn't make a difference now. They'll take a picture of your license plate if you drive straight through. I mean, you can't stop to pay anymore anyway. You pay and, and Levi is one of those guys. He's not an income tax collector. He's the, he's the guy who sits there. And if you moved your goods that you made from point A to point B, you paid Levi. Now, how did this work? Rome told Levi how much he had to collect for Rome. But Levi had absolute freedom to charge anything above and beyond what Rome wanted. That's why when tax collectors came to John the Baptist... And they said, well, what should we do, you know, in response to, you know, the Messiah is coming? He said, don't extort money. And extortion was, was charging twice the amount to pocket for yourself and uh, to keep that. And he said, D collect only what is due. Well, all of a sudden, you, you don't make anything anymore as a tax collector if you work for Rome. And so Levi's in this particular uh, you know, position, but the call of Jesus is, is powerful. These guys were criminals in the Jewish culture, a tax collector, because you're, you're working for Gentile Rome, 
And number two, you're stealing money from me. They were Jewish criminals. And those are the people Jesus hangs out with. The criminals of the Jewish culture. And the outcasts who are shunned and separated. Do, do you know some of those folks in your community? The outcasts, the criminals, the shunned, the lepers. They're all over our communities. All over. And Jesus says, that's how churches rebuild because they're grabbing the outcasts <laughs> and they're inviting them to come meet Jesus. Okay. So in this particular case, we know there's a chief tax collector. We're going to get to him in Luke 19. His name is anybody, the chief tax collector, you know, his story. He's a wee little man. A wee little man was he Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. He's over Levi. He's a guy who's over Levi. He's got a better Jewish position because he's taking the cut from Levi before he gives it to Rome. <laughs> okay, supervisor. All of this is going together here. And you remember in Luke chapter 18, there, there's the parable of the prayer between the Pharisee and the tax collector. Oh. And the Pharisee prays, oh God, I thank you. I am not like other men. Like this guy here. Oh, to they were despised. See, Jewish tax collectors were criminals and despised. And Jesus calls one of them to be his ministry partner. And his life is so radically overturned, a criminal, an outcast. Right? He becomes a ministry partner. Well, Matthew writes a gospel. You're, you're, you, you, you like to read this criminal's gospel, don't you? Don't you? Matthew is one of our favorite. Pastor Al preached through that. Oh, it took years, didn't it? Matthew, a criminal. And it's in Holy Scripture, right? Talking about transformation. Woo! Uh, question six is personal acceptance of outcasts, the avenue for the Holy Spirit to awaken need of God? Is this an avenue, question six? Is, is personal acceptance of outcasts an avenue that the Holy Spirit uses? I heard one person say yes. Anybody want to amplify? It's like the fisher, or the, the nets that the fishermen will use. Okay. Personal acceptance of outcasts. Yeah. Shows me how proud I am. Lord, help me. Uh, you know what? Am I am I willing to get a little dirty? Because because rubbing elbows with you know, I mean, Willow Creek was always very very. Uh, they, I mean, just had the. I love their you know irreligious people, irreligious people. Are you willing to rub elbows? With irreligious people in Watoma and Coloma and Hancock and Lorva, are you willing to get a little dirty? Because it does, it gets messy, right? And and Jesus is modeling this for us, T -p taking a risk. He's modeling this, and he go and and yeah, yeah. I mean, none of us have that power of God, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we have the Word of God, and we have the promise of God. I don't think we're shortchanged as believers. Do you? No. I, you know, as far as being able to reach a Levi, reach an outcast, reach a criminal, right? It's like, oh, Halloween's coming. And it's like, man, I'm going away. I don't want anybody around. You know, it's like we, we can't be the running Christians. We got to be the Christians who are inviting some of these criminals into our houses. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's risk, isn't there? Yeah, there's risk. So he, here, the you know, the Pharisees and the scribes see that Jesus have, is having this party. We, we call this an evangelistic party. Levi invites all of his cronies. Who, who's in the party? Who's in the party? 29. Who's invited? All these other criminals. Because who else does Levi know? 
those are the only ones that will associate with them. Right? Folks, and we always say this purposefully, right? God has put people in each one of our reach that some of the rest of us in this room can't reach. He has put people in your circle of influence, whether it's people at your work, whether it's people on your block, or it's people in your library book reading you know, club, your knitting club. He's put people in your circle that someone else cannot reach. That's where evangelistic parties need to happen. Where you, man, I'm so thrilled. I just, you know, I want to invite you to come to know Jesus like I've come to know him. And Jesus is present. It's the criminals who are coming to the dinner and eating with them, right? And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they're on notice because Christ has raised the ante by doing a messianic miracle. Nobody else has ever healed, you know, this this leper guy. They're on notice and they come and they complain to, interesting, they complain to his disciples. Now, there are six disciples that are actually gathered by Jesus by this point. John mentions the other ones that have been gathered. Luke doesn't, he, he won't mention, I think till next week, the 12 will be listed by Luke next week, but Luke didn't record the, the calling of all 12. There are six that uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, and Bartholomew have already been called by Christ at this point. And the Pharisees go to them and say, hey, why, why, why does your, your master eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Don't you know that the Holy Scripture says are you ready? Be holy because I, the Lord, your God am. You, well, you can't sit with these people then because you can't be. Do, do you see where the rules are coming in? How do we fulfill this rule of be holy? One of the 600, you know, 13 commands in the Pentateuch. How do we do this? And the Pharisees took the understanding then of being holy by doing what? With Criminals and sinners. Separate. Separate. Folks, churches turn into holy huddles who take on a pharisaical philosophy of we don't want the mess of messy people in our church. That's when a church becomes a holy huddle, right? It's too much risk for me to invite that person in. Too much risk. And Jesus jumps in and gets muddy, <laughs> you know, with the, ta- the tax collectors and the sinners. Incredible, right? So, oh, you know, how do you read Holy Scripture and how do you apply it is always uh, a, a challenge for us in every way. But perhaps doing it the way the Pharisees did, you know, wasn't really the right way. So here's how Jesus is going to answer the question. Why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why? He'll give three answers. Two of them, Luke records. One of them, he doesn't. So look at your text, verse 31. Jesus will answer why he eats with criminals, tax collectors, and sinners. Answer number one, verse 31. Go ahead. Who's the physician? Christ, who's the sick in this text? The tax collectors and the sinners. And who are the healthy in this text? Yeah, supposedly. Do, Do you see the mission of Christ? Now, this becomes interesting because they don't know. They think they're healthy, but they don't know that they're terminally ill. Folks, we we all understand doctrine of sin. Terminally ill means being separated from God forever, right? The whole world is under that terminal illness. But your neighbors, some of your family, some of your friends, they think, I'm healthy. I don't need a doctor. I don't need Jesus. I don't need your religion. I don't need your washer community. And they don't know that they're terminally ill. And if they don't get to a doctor, they will die and go to hell forever. That, that's a pretty clear statement. That's the first thing Jesus said. That's why he eats with sinners because they'll go to hell. If I don't eat with them and invite them to know the Holy God, they'll go to hell. 
Go home and have that on your conscience tonight, brothers and sisters. (laughs) People you care about will go to hell if I don't care enough to share Christ with them. They'll go to hell. Oh. (laughs) Oh. Oh, this come follow thing is pretty big deal, right? It's a pretty big deal. The second thing Jesus said, Luke didn't record. I don't know why he didn't record it, but in Matthew 9, verse 13, in your notes, the second answer he gave is the reason I eat with sinners and tax collectors is because I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Anybody remember that quote? Matthew records this alone. Jesus said, I des- he's quoting from Hosea chapter 6 or 6. Remember when we studied Hosea? He quotes, I desire mercy. See, the, the separatist thing isn't going to work, right? You, you're separating yourself from the sinners, the people who are sick and need Jesus most. You need to come together to them. Jesus says the way to do that is to be merciful to people who are sick to bring them mercy, to bring them the good news, to bring them the gospel of Christ, to bring them the good news of there's a mansion being built for you. Turn and repent. Come to know Christ. I desire mercy, not not the religious ritual of sacrifice. I desire mercy. Luke didn't record that. I don't know why. Matthew recorded that. And then the third answer that he gives in verse uh, 32 I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Because he's come to call them to repentance. What does repentance mean? What's the road sign of repentance? A U-turn. I've come to call sinners to turn around and to come to me, right? And in this particular thing, he has not come to call the, who's the righteous in this text? Does that mean that they're going to heaven righteous? Yeah, see, so be careful with the use of the word here. Here Here's the sense of self-righteous. Self-righteous. They have no, they have no cognizance of their mortal problem. Self-righteous. They don't need a doctor. So Christ has come to call sinners to repentance. And the Holy Spirit, marvelously, when, when we speak about sin as a problem and Christ as the solution, the Holy Spirit works in hearts and works in ears and works in eyes when we do that, you know, in studies and in personal, you know, witnessing in Sunday morning and so forth. So that's why Jesus does this. And now we got to finish with the question about fasting. And it's like, well, we, we should have barred food tonight. <laughs> yeah it's my fault see ministry is messy isn't it here's the third of five controversies as we close our text tonight the issue of fasting the third of five controversies and in verse 33 the controversy is jesus is not playing nicely in the sandbox with the pharisees John's disciples fast, the Pharisees and their disciples fast, but Jesus doesn't fast. Uh, And don't you find it interesting that sometimes churches really get, uh, maybe not necessarily on the issue of fasting, but we get our preferences of what we do and what we don't do that defines Christianity. And there's great disagreement among churches, right, on things. Great disagreement. This isn't a salvation issue, fasting or not fasting. It's not a salvation issue. You don't lose heaven because you failed to fast, you see. But here's a preference thing. The Pharisees made laws about this and that you you should be fasting. And John the Baptist was, you know, Jesus' sidekick who got everything started. And he's fasting and praying. But Jesus and his disciples are not praying. Now, rabbinic oral law, this this whole thing of writing laws on how to keep Moses' laws, writing laws, you know, on how to keep Moses' laws, this all developed in your notes between 450 B.C. and 30 B.C. Rabbinic oral law was written down and codified and put down uh, where rules were developed around the 613 laws that Moses has printed in the Pentateuch. This was, again, to prevent Israel from going back into captivity. Israel was so, the Pharisees were so conscious that, yeah, our sin 
cause 70 years of captivity. We don't want to go there again by God's divine punishment. Therefore, let's figure out how to obey the law. So for every single law, there could be dozens, if not hundreds of other ways that you had to act in order to keep the law. So I read one today, uh, you know, where uh, Orthodox Jewish people have to have two sets of dishes. Do you know why? Because you're not supposed to mix meat and milk or dairy. And if you didn't cleanse a particular dish that you had meat on and then you had cheese the next day, you have violated. You see, it, this is getting crazy, yeah, folks. Well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> These laws are being written during the intertestamental period when the Bible, when God is silent from the end of Malachi until the coming of Christ, this silent period of 400 years is when Jewish laws were being codified. This oral law, the oral tradition. Later in Luke, why don't you follow the tradition of your of the elders? You see, they, they challenge Jesus on this. And then he starts calling them whitewashed tombs and stuff like that. And things get really ugly. Okay. When we get to Matthew chapter 23. So during this time period, now, in fact, there is only one day one day in the Pentateuch when uh, the nation of Israel was to fast. That day was the, the, the Day of Atonement. One day. That's it. There, there was no other requirement. But by the New Testament time that we're in right now, the Pharisees are fasting. Anybody knows how often? The gospel, there's a clue in the gospels in uh, chapter 18, verse 12, twice a week twice a week that's where this text comes from then why are your disciples not fasting jesus because we're we're doing this holy piety twice a week and we feel that's the way to fulfill moses law of once a year (laughs) is this like making sense to everybody twice a week in fact the days were monday and thursday monday and thursday and your whole life your routine your ritual had to revolve around fasting on Monday and Thursday. Those were the specific days that the Pharisees fasted. That's the background for this entire thing. So they fasted twice a week. And and it's interesting. I even read one Jewish guy today who said, uh, you know, when you make a sacrifice, you burn the, the, the burnt offering, you burn the fat on the altar, and the blood of the animal was poured out around the altar, and you know, the specific things of that. They linked fasting to the same sacrificial ritual so that when I fast, I'm giving, I'm losing my fat for the Lord and my blood is, is being poured out or spilled out. This almost verges on like a a Catholic thing that it was meritorious to fast for the Pharisees because they were losing fat and blood when they fasted. And this was for God. It it almost turns meritorious in, in the Jewish system right here. Okay, so um, and we have no particular record after Jesus temptation in the wilderness that Jesus fasted. We have no particular record in the Gospels that he participated (laughs) in any fasting. Thus, the 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 uh, question, everybody else, you know, that's near and around you is doing this, but you're not. What's wrong with you, Jesus? (laughs) What's wrong with you, Jesus? There's four answers he gives and then we'll close. There's four answers that Jesus gives of why he doesn't do the ritual fast of the Pharisees, which you have to understand, it's not a biblical requirement. The one day a year was Moses' law, not twice a week. So Jesus will answer in four ways why he doesn't fast, and we'll close with that right now, okay? Number one, we're in verse 34. Because there's a wedding currently going on verse 34 it's the bridegroom's wedding and when you're at a wedding does anybody fast what do you do at a wedding there's the word you feast who's the bridegroom in verse 34 jesus right and the wedding is of course the kingdom of god which has now come to earth in the in the personal presence of jesus And he is bringing his bride. He is calling his guests to himself. And so we have the parable of the wedding banquet 
in Matthew, right? And the guy comes in, he doesn't have the right garments on. And we have the parable of the tenants where they throw, you know, the, uh, the uh, son of the landowner out. You know, we have all kinds of parables that are coming up. But Jesus says, well, this is, this is why I'm not fasting because right now is a time of celebration. The son of God is on earth and he's gathering his bride to himself. It's the wrong time to fast. You ought to be feasting. Okay. Answer number one. That's in verse 34, right? Then we go to verse uh, 36, the second answer. And this one revolves around a second word picture of new garments and old garments. <laughs> Tonight, which one are you wearing? Are you wearing your new? No, I mean literally. Old. Yeah, some of you brought, some of you came in in an old garment, right? Yeah, a guy with a t-shirt on over there or something, you know. Gal, Yeah. <laughs> right? He's going to use a word picture to say why he doesn't fast with garments. The new garment is a picture then of whom? Uh, yeah, I'm going to specifically say Jesus. Jesus is the picture of the, the, the new garment. Who's the old garment in this text? The Pharisees are the picture of the old garment. And the two are not compatible. If you take part of the new garment and rip a patch out of it, you've destroyed the new garment. Then you take that new cloth and sew it on old cloth, and everybody who sews and washes understands the issue of shrinkage and so forth. This combination of legalism of Judaic Pharisees and Jesus who says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, these two aren't compatible. You cannot come to God by works and come to God by grace. That's probably more familiar to us than this word picture. The two are incompatible. They are not both ways to God. And with this old garment of the Pharisees, you cannot get to God by your religious works, by your religious doing. You've got to come to God by Christ, who offers mercy and grace to every sinner, criminal, tax collector, and person at WCC. Okay, that's the second answer of why he, he is not going to fast, right? It's the picture of, of the garments. Then we go in verse 37. Then there's new wine and old wineskins. And there's lots of folks who love these word pictures, right? <laughs> new wine and old wineskins. You get the point, right? I mean, it was, it was uh, calf or sheep skin, which was tanned, the hair taken off and sewn up. That, that was your, 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 your vessel, that, especially if it was going to be portable. Otherwise, you'd have a clay pot for storage of water and wine, like at the wedding. But the, the animal, where the neck was, is, is where the neck of the fill spout was, that, right? That the skin of the animal's you know, neck is where the, the fill would be. And Jesus says, nobody puts new wine into an old wineskin you understand the issue of fermentation without refrigeration, right? Everybody understands that. In this picture, who's the new wine? Jesus. Jesus. Who's the old wine skin, which is dried, cracked, not elastic, not flexible? I mean, those are the word pictures. Who's that? The Pharisees. See, in this whole particular section, Judaism, right? These two, you don't do that. These two can't go together. It's really similar to the second reason. And thus Jesus says, that's the reason I don't fast because this isn't what God wants. And, and it's not in the Holy word itself either. Now, the hardest one as we close is the fourth answer. Why Jesus does not fast the way the Pharisees do. It's the picture then of new wine and aged wine, new wine and aged wine. Now, if we keep the new and old metaphors consistent, which I think is the best way to interpret this text. If we keep the consistency, the new garment, the new wine has always been a picture of Christ. I think that's very clear. The old was the picture of the Pharisees who have made this stuff up in this particular case. If we're consistent, the old wine in this particular case then is the Pharisees and the, you know, the, the, their movement in particular, and the new wine, of course, we understand is Christ. Now you get to this statement where it says the old is better. The old is better. 
Because you're accustomed to it. It's familiar. Okay. It's familiar. There was one guy who said, you know what? Sometimes, even in the best of churches, there's a narcotic spirituality where churches and people become numb to the things that matter to God. I'll let you weigh that. But in this particular case, the old is better. Jesus is not saying all of a sudden, chuck me and take Pharisees. You understand that? I mean, he, he can't be saying that in the last statement, right? Chuck me, the old is better when he's just three times said, the old and the new can't mix. So many interpreters believe then that this is a statement of Judaism's rejection of Jesus. The old is better. We're sticking with our system of works and sacrifice and law. We're sticking with that. The old is better. Fine wine that's aged is much better than new wine. People take it then as a statement of rejection of Christ. It's not a statement where Jesus has flipped tables and all of a sudden, okay, I give up. The Pharisees really are better. Do you see that would be inconsistent in the interpretation of the text? The only other way this final verse 39 can be taken is if you change the meaning of the metaphors, which I think is a violation of interpretation. You change the meaning of the metaphor. In other words, the old wine, this is where we're going to close, the old wine is mosaic or biblical uh, mosaic uh, scripture and understanding. In other words, go back to the original source of the word of God, the mosaic law, not the interpretation of it, which is the new wine, the Pharisees. That's a harder interpretation. I think it's because you have to switch the meaning of the metaphors. The old now then takes you back to the mosaic law. Jesus advocates that's the best. Take God's word at its literalness and don't let anybody, you know, mess with it. But those are the two interpretations you're going to get out of this. And, and in the end, it's like, oh, Jesus, you're a breath of fresh air for me. Yeah. And then we'll have to close pretty quick. Thanks for the extra time. Jesus is, you and I, Jesus is bringing something new to these people yeah. and not trying to patch up something old. Yeah, not trying to patch up something old, right? But bear, but bear in mind when we say this, right, has, has the gospel not been preached in Holy Scripture since Genesis 3.15? So, so bear in mind when we say Jesus is bringing something new, because here, here's, here's the hook and here's the particular problem when people say that. Well, the gospel isn't in the Old Testament. Well, then all of a sudden God has changed. <laughs> He's not the same in the Old Testament and the New. Do you, do, do you see? The gospel is all over the Old Testament. But there's eyes that are blind and ears that are deaf, and they cannot see. And, and that's where I see the Pharisees at this point. The gospel, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as he was a saved man in the Old Testament. So, you know, that's where, you know, this issue, the gospel, and Jesus hasn't changed from yesterday, today, or forever, you see. So it's a rich word. I, I pray you're blessed by that. And uh, next week we carry on with more of the controversies. And, you know, isn't that the grace of God, though, as we close? Jesus is bringing everything to the front and to the table for these religious leaders to say, oh, you are the Messiah. He's bringing everything to as he's doing to us, as the word of God is taught on Sundays, as it's taught in your small groups, if you're in other groups. As you listen, Jesus is bringing his gospel, his refreshing wine, and uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's still opening uh, blind eyes and deaf ears. Heavenly Father, we do praise you for this holy word tonight that we've explored, and, and we ask your Holy Spirit to seal to our hearts uh, the blessing of this text as we, as we drive home tonight and as we uh, process and pray over what we have studied and read and heard this night tonight, Holy Spirit, seal to our hearts the truth of God's word. Thank you, Jesus, for being our model. And, and Lord, we ask for your divine help and aid. As we know, we have a wonderful, powerful community to reach. Wonderful, wonderful people, irreligious people. They don't know they need a doctor. 
And God, you've asked us to use the tool of your word and mercy to be compassionate and merciful and to reach out people, to invite them to know you. God, aid us and help us as a church to do that again. And as individual people now, Lord, who are called to do that tonight, empower us, Lord, to do that for the honor and glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.